Saga Emerald Beyond, the newest entry in the Saga series, is scheduled for a simultaneous global release on April 25th, 2024. And with its announcement comes new intrigue for this historic, long-running franchise of open-ended, player-focused RPGs. With the promise of multiple worlds, five separate protagonists to choose from, dozens of playable characters, strategic combat, and the developer note that no two players' first experiences will necessarily be the same, it's easy to see the appeal of Emerald Beyond. Knowing that this game is just one of 25 other main Saga entries is daunting knowledge, though, and for those unfamiliar or only recently acquainted with the series, there persists the very resonant question of where do I start with the Saga games? Welcome to part three of my three-part newcomer's primer and series digest for Saga. In this video, I hope to help you find the best game to start with. This is part three of a three-part series, but these videos can be watched in any order. So if you want to see a brief overview of all 26 games in the series, go ahead and check out part one. If you want to know a little bit more about the shared mechanics and a brief history of the series, go ahead and check out part two. But if you're just here for recommendations, this is the place to be, so please don't drift off yet. And before all the pitchforks come out, I just want to say for posterity that where I think the best places for a newcomer to start with this series are just that. They're just opinions, okay? Nothing here is supposed to be definitive. In fact, I hate that word and I will not be using it at all in this video. People are unique and we all have different, varied experiences. But that being said, I still do want to know what works for you and what does not. Accessibility and availability were two major considerations for this video. I know emulator usage can be daunting for some, and not everybody is willing to track down expensive, physical copies of retro games that oftentimes have little Timmy's drawings of cool dudes with swords in the inserts. If you're a purist and you want to play the original games on original hardware, these games still really hold up, but you don't need me to tell you that. Now, I've played through these games before, but for this video, I recently went back and I played through the first few hours of each game, and I tried my absolute best to view them through the lens of a newcomer. And I've glimmered some new insights, and I'm excited to help people find the game that feels best for them. One of Saga's main appeals is that the games are designed around very player-curated experiences rather than rigid ones. So part of the beauty of these games is discovering things for yourself. They do take chances though, so if you feel like something about the first Saga game you play doesn't vibe with you, I urge you not to give up on the series and just try another one. There might be something there that works better for your preferences. I've wasted enough of your time though, so let's just get into the meat and potatoes of this video and just start with the recommendations. A hobby of mine is destroying all tension and drama in the content that I create, so I'll start this off with what is my general all-purpose answer of what Saga game is best to start with. It's going to be Saga Frontier Remastered, available on Android, iOS, PS4, Steam, and Switch. My tagline for this recommendation is the best saga to start with to ease you into the mechanics and feel of the series. Frontier is probably the quickest moving saga remaster available. For example, the ability to flee from battles makes everything feel very painless, whereas in the original PlayStation version you could eat a series of frustrating on-map encounters and unintentionally crank up the enemy scaling. Speaking of which, one component that could put off newcomers to Saga, and this game in particular, is battle rank, or the enemy scaling mechanic of the game. The more battles the player completes, the stronger enemies will become, but the remaster of Frontier makes navigating the scaling much easier with the ability to flee from most encounters. Additionally, Frontier's battle scaling may not seem as prominent in some other entries, for reasons I'll get into in just a bit. Each of the eight scenarios is a bite-sized serving of this game's universe, so it's easier to not feel as in over your head on a first playthrough. Each scenario is one piece of the puzzle, an analogy that applies to both narrative and gameplay aspects. Riki's story eases you into monster mechanics, T260G's path is mech-focused, Blue's scenario is centered around the magic subquests, Amelia's starts you off with team building and dungeons, etc. etc. 
No matter the player's entry point, they will still be fairly well introduced to at least one major element of the game, which is knowledge they can bring with them into the endgame and other scenarios. It's like Saga Tapas, eight small plates and a wide array of flavors and textures. Frontier has a unique setting that may be appealing for fans of Square's PlayStation era of RPGs. There are typical areas like castles and caves, and of course there's a sewer, which seems to be the 90s square analog of From Software Swamps, but we also have fairly modern looking villages, cyberpunk towns, futuristic hodgepodges, and a casino parking lot. There are so many visual offerings and themed locations here that sometimes exploration for the sake of scenery is a journey unto itself. Exploration is also streamlined and getting around is quick. There's no traversable big world map because most areas are connected to hubs. Within Frontier are several playable races, quirky dialogue, absurd plotting, flashy combo attacks, unique playable characters, and a part fantastical, part bizarre, but always full of charm bestiary. This game is like candy. And just like candy, the quickness at which the player sparks text, levels up magic, and acquires new tools can make this game feel intensely satisfying. Early combat in Frontier is often a quickly mounting Solaritus dopamine rush, which serves as a fantastic introduction to how rewarded the player can feel despite the somewhat unconventional, almost horizontal progression of the Saga games. And it's all about that progression, baby. If you played this game when you were younger but didn't vibe with it, then I'd urge you to give it another shot now. Also, as a kid, I definitely thought this game was called Salsa Frontier, which makes me think that Rick Bayless is seriously missing an opportunity for cross-media marketing here. Compared to the pre-2021 remasters, there's an increased focus on quality of life. Features like tutorials, autosave, speed-up options, and the ability to carry over so many things from a cleared scenario, including HP, help make Frontier easier to approach than many other games in the series. But let's move on to some points against this game's being a saga starter pack. Frontier has a bit of notoriety for being unfinished, and even with the remaster, it can be argued that it's a fairly incomplete game. This might leave players wanting more in some ways, but that's also why it's a good stepping stone into other sagas, and as evidenced by this video series, if one wants more, there is more Saga. There is more Saga available on modern platforms too. To some, Frontier's gameplay is not as expansive or long form as other entries. Some of this could be argued as superficial, but things like the slimming down of weapon types, not as many big, plot-heavy moments as RPG enthusiasts expect, and several small areas can get in the way of a full experience. Additionally, as much as I recommend and praise the family-style dining, patchwork presentation of Frontier, please don't expect this game to answer all of your plot or mechanic questions. You might feel like you skipped a course somewhere, but you'll probably always remember the entrees and dessert. Some scenarios might be off-putting for a first-time player, but keep in mind that part of the fun of this game is poking around and seeing what does and doesn't work for you. Because of this, I don't want to necessarily give recommendations for what the best scenario to start with is. I just want to reiterate that I think making mistakes or working through a challenging circumstance is part of what makes these games resonate with players, and I encourage throwing a little caution to the wind for this game and series as a whole should you be willing to give it a shot. Pick the character you think looks most appealing to you, and if it doesn't work out you could always hop back on the app and start swiping again. I pretty much unanimously recommend the remaster over the original, but it's worth considering some aesthetics. The smoothening and sharpness of the new models in the remaster look a little too clean to me, and I'm not a fan of the new font and menu UI, even if they present more information to the player and are easier to read. Look, I'm a big font guy, so that crunchy, compressed, colorful text has a certain magic to it, and sometimes the little aesthetic touches make a world of presentational difference. Another major contender for best entry to start with is the 2019 remaster of Romancing Saga 3. This is my recommendation for the best saga to start with if you're looking for the most all-encompassing display of classic series mechanics, especially if you're willing to be a little patient. Progression and team building are extremely expansive in Romancing Saga 3. There's a treasure trove of options for unique playable characters, weapon types, magic, equipment loadouts, and so on. 
We have some capital C content here, folks, which includes a robust array of offensive and defensive options. Balance is always going to be an issue in older RPGs like this, though, so some builds may seem more optimal than others, but whatever path the player finds themselves going down will usually yield powerful options. Pretty much every character can be configured to the player's specifications, so making the intended magic users physical powerhouses, or vice versa, is certainly an option if the player is willing to tailor the experience. This is usually the case in Saga games, but it feels especially liberating in a game with this many choices. Additionally, there is also a Commander mode that also functions as a fairly unique auto-battler. The world is incredibly open and rife with unique discoveries. Each town and area has something unique about it, and even if some quests literally and figuratively string the player along, tasks are always rewarded with some permutation of items, money, or unlocks. The net of the gameplay loop is cast widely, and getting powerful through discovery of the world is a slow, steady process that ebbs and flows. The enemy scaling in battle rank in RS3 are among the most friendly in the series, and the remaster offers some nifty options to smoothen out the adventure. While enemies in some bosses will scale to the number of battles you've won, it's done a little bit more granularly. Basically, only on-map enemy types scale, so if you kill like 200 fish enemies, you fight progressively stronger fish mobs. Rarely will you find yourself behind the curve in normal battles because of the control you have over which encounters you choose to scale. Additionally, some quests are locked behind player HP. The availability of progression is curated to what the player should be able to finish without getting stuck. But should you feel like you are stuck in a dungeon or boss fight that you can't leave, or maybe you just don't like the choices you made this playthrough, the remaster offers a fairly unique feature and one of the main reasons why I recommend this game so highly to newcomers. The ability to start a new game with the text, spells, and most stats, items, and equipment from any save file at any time. This means that one's hard work is never truly spoiled, and it can even give a new player the option to make the early and mid game much friendlier by taking over the carryover potential. This New Game Plus feature provides an interesting eject button. At any point, one can start a new game with a character they may like more without feeling like they lost something. Other features of this remaster include upscaled graphical assets, bug fixes, slightly quicker gameplay compared to the Super Famicom version, some content rebalances, and a new bonus dungeon to help swing the power level in the player's favor by offering powerful new items and static enemy configurations to grind. To further reinforce these themes of player choice and impact, sparking techniques in combat in RS3 crescendos as powerfully as the score. It's a different kind of dopamine rush compared to Frontier. In RS3, the game is longer on average, and you can pool skills and teach them to everyone, so the oomph factor of sparking new techniques resonates and carries over to more than just one party member. The utility of being able to eventually pass skills on to anyone in your party does wonders for team building and progression for newcomers. Lastly, if you've played ReUniverse, this is most likely my best recommendation for you to start with. ReUniverse follows the story of RS3 and has the most aesthetic familiarity. In the interest of fairness, let's put some points against RS3 here. For a modern remaster, gameplay, especially continued battles, can feel painfully slow and there is no speed up feature. Dialogue scrolls slowly and even though you can flee from most encounters without cranking up enemy scaling, you can still repeatedly and frustratingly get trapped into encounters. This remaster was originally designed for mobile devices and was then subsequently ported to other platforms, so the UI and UX might seem questionable to some. The biggest consequence of this is that there now seems to be additive input lag. This can make the user experience feel extremely clunky and unresponsive, which makes the above encounter frustrations even more apparent. Anecdotally speaking, from someone who is extremely sensitive to input lag, I don't think this is a deal breaker, but it is a bummer that even a 2019 remaster can feel dated only just a few years later. I'm once again going to call attention to the questionable font choice. The sprites look amazing in HD because they were purposely left somewhat untouched, but some of the background smoothening and upscaling looks a little too sterile. Your mileage may vary depending on your preference for Vaseline. 
This game ultimately requires more patience than my other recommendations, and the 16-bit style might be a hard sell if you want some more modern, instant gratification. For people who love the Chrono Triggers and Final Fantasy VI's that rely on a more familiar structure, this might not be exactly what you're expecting despite the visuals looking the part of Square's classic 16-bit era. Those same RPG veterans might not like the way RS3 does exploration. No searching for ethers and clocks, or looking for treasures in people's drawers. Instead, talking to townsfolk and parsing out quests for goodies is the move here. We gossip instead of poke our head into crevices. Quest progression can definitely be more esoteric, even among its contemporaries, but sometimes the joy of exploration outweighs the trepidation. Let me just get on a soapbox real fast, because I've seen a lot of discussion about this subject in relation to the remasters, but please don't see the new additions and quality of life as ruining these games. A new player isn't getting an inauthentic experience by playing these remasters first. Yes, the original versions of these games have a slightly different balance due to their not having the remaster features and additions, but viewing new features simply as a crutch is disingenuous to the games. Saga remasters and remakes have always leaned heavily on hindsight and player feedback throughout the years, and that might be a reason why these games are just now catching on more with general audiences. Those who crave the original experiences can go back to those at any time, and if you personally become a fan of this series later down the line, returning to those original releases can be a fun little experiment for you. The entire plot of Romancing Saga 3 deals with gatekeeping, so I don't know, I thought I would draw some attention to that here, and plus there's nothing cornier than making a niche RPG series even more niche just because, I don't know, ego distension or something stupid, so just don't do that, man. My final big recommendation for best game to start with is Saga Scarlet Grace Ambitions, available for Android, iOS, Nintendo Switch, PS4, and Windows. Scarlet Grace is the saga to start with for those who want what will probably be the closest experience to Emerald Beyond. If you're a fan of non-traditional RPGs, this one is especially for you. Emerald Beyond seems to be based on Scarlet Grace's core timeline battle system, and the way map traversal and events play out in that game look like a direct successor of what Scarlet Grace offers. With that being said, Scarlet Grace provides what is probably the widest breadth of tutorials, guides, and mechanical explanations in the entire series. This isn't perfect though, because Saga always seems to want to David Lynchify our understanding and expectations by not telling us everything that we probably should know. Elaborate on that. No, I won't. <laughs> um, n no one, no one uh, sees it. But Scarlet Grace's guidance will provide a solid fundamental understanding of the core systems at play. The base mechanics of Scarlet Grace are worked in through each character's introduction, and the grand scope of the game becomes more apparent earlier than most Saga titles. This game greatly streamlines aspects of the genre that might bog down modern RPG experiences. Series producer Akitoshi Kawazu even said something to the effect of, we wanted to trim the fat of the genre. Scarlet Grace doesn't have explorable dungeons like most would expect in RPGs, the world is a series of nodes that the player moves to in between, and events and battles play out accordingly. Dungeons are just a series of two or more back-to-back -back battles, and while that does test resources to some extent, gone is the concept of walking through a long, boring cave. Party members can be cycled in and out fairly loosely, which facilitates player experimentation by means of quickly mixing up strategies, bringing a cool new character into the retinue, or trying out new weapons and spells. This is a big, varied world, and even the gameplay systems want to reflect that. Because Scarlet Grace eschews some typical RPG structure, it's able to focus on what could arguably be its greatest strength, its incredibly complex, nuanced battle system. Combat design is balanced less around stat checks and more about tactical prowess and loadouts. The game is often not about just simply surviving and dishing out bigger numbers, which puts a focus on Saga's strats, not stats, sensibility. There seems to be an almost SRPG quality to the party building in this game, which may appeal to fans of the genre in games like Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics, and even Fire Emblem. Animations are fairly quick and full of charm, so most of the time spent in battle doesn't feel as much like impatiently waiting for the next turn.
The plot mixes elements of the Prometheus myth, the collapse of the Roman Empire, and takes influence from several different cultures to create a world full of intrigue. It also knows how to be playful to keep pace. Most side quests have a significant impact on the world which extends to giving or taking away options for the player. The choices made in each scenario carry significant weight, and subsequent playthroughs can provide new insight or rewards depending on how the player resolves events and quests. The humor and brevity ejected into the writing adds variety to the narrative experience. The game's introduction also serves as a sort of personality quiz to help the player parse out which character they should start with. But if you land on a character that you're not a big fan of or don't like the design of, you can always just switch at the end of it. While some aspects of Scarlet Grace might seem uncomfortable at a glance, it reminds us that sometimes it's important to challenge our preconceptions and expectations. Just because a game feels familiar doesn't mean it's going to be good or enjoyable. Likewise, a game is also not inherently deeper or better because it's unconventional, so with that I'd like to touch on a couple things that might deter this game from being a good starting point. The sense of power scaling can make you feel underpowered compared to many traditional RPGs. While you can get absurdly overpowered, it takes far more game knowledge and strategic application to get to that point. Some players might find themselves cursing RNG, and while RNG can definitely work against you, it's sometimes easy to forget to not balance your strategies on jackpot contingencies. Also, the presentation might not land with everybody. This is essentially an update of a Vita game, which was designed with the console's portability in mind. There isn't that much voice acting in the game, and some of the irony and nuance of the dub could come off as awkward. The two times battle and overworld speed options are locked behind the completion of a playthrough. This is honestly a questionable choice, like I see the vision, but it feels like this may unnecessarily bloat the playtime of a first playthrough. The Switch version also has some performance issues, but it's not too much of a deal breaker. This game is a prime example of hit or miss, but it's at least worth making an effort to appreciate it. If you absolutely cannot handle the things that Scarlet Grace lacks, this game might do absolutely nothing for you. But if some of the core conceits of the battle system and streamlining seem interesting, Emerald Beyond might be something closer to what you're looking for. I want to quickly pay credence to the titles that didn't make the main cut. I don't think they're bad places to start by any means, just not the first games that I'd immediately recommend to most newcomers, so let's quickly go through this. Romancing Saga Minstrel Song Remastered is marvelously deep, and it's probably the most jam-packed game in the series. It has just about every series staple that we've seen here, and has an overwhelming amount of content and playstyle potential. The presentation is somewhat of an acquired taste, however, and it might be too overwhelming for new players because of its complex, intertwining subsystems. Battle and event rank can be damning to early impressions of this game as well. Minstrel Song fires on all cylinders once you feel more comfortable with Saga, but until you do, it can be kind of risky as a first entry. That being said, it's one of the best remasters I've seen a developer put out in a very long time and one of my favorite games in the series, so I do recommend checking it out at some point. It came out only a couple years ago for mobile devices, PC, Switch, PS4, and PS5. The 2016 remaster of Romancing Saga 2 is another amazing game with several caveats. The core generational mechanic of the game can be confusing or impenetrable to newcomers, and the fact that you don't have static party members in a traditional sense might be a hard sell despite its unique premise. In 2016, the remaster quality hadn't quite hit its stride yet, and the clunky UX that I criticized Romancing Saga 3 for is even more prevalent in this game. The early game can be rough. It ends up having a more approachable mid to end game as the player becomes more acquainted with it, but there are just so many missables and off-kilter progression mechanics here for me to recommend this as a first choice to most people brand new to the franchise. It's a wonderful, all-consuming game though, so if you like RS3, I'd recommend considering playing this one eventually as well. It's available on mobile devices, PS4, Switch, Xbox One, and Vita. Collection of Saga, a bundle with the first three Saga titles for Game Boy, might be worth considering if you're interested in the origins of the series. These are the first three Saga games, and while the seeds may have been sown here, many of the series' core traits wouldn't be developed until Romancing Saga for the Super Famicom. A new player might not get enough of the Saga spice with these games. 
But these are three fairly simple, customizable RPGs that play far more traditionally than most of the games on this list. There's a big nostalgia factor for these games if you're a fan of the genre or a fan of the late 80s, early 90s portable RPGs that eventually inspired Pokemon. But ultimately, this trilogy might seem archaic or simple if you're looking for a rich, spiraling experience. No PlayStation or Xbox releases for this one, so availability might be a factor if you don't want to play this on mobile or PC. Romancing Saga Reuniverse deserves a special note here. It's the title that has probably brought in the most amount of Saga newcomers in the past few years. And I don't want to let my anti-mobile bias cloud my judgment, but despite the gacha and service model, it's honestly a great way to sample the aesthetics and get a feel for what the series offers. The universal 16-bit sprite work is fantastically made, the key art is varied and eclectic, the soundtrack is full of bangers, and the spell effects are flashy without looking too modern and disruptive to the style of the game. It's a free download and easy to give a spin, so it's not hard to find an alluring character who is from a game you might vibe with too. Despite its pretty meticulous mechanics though, the gameplay systems might still be a little bit too mobile forward and time specific for folks who crave a more typical console feel. Reuniverse is great eye candy though, and it's a nice sampling plate to whet the appetite while you wait for a sale or deliberate which game seems best for you to start with. And that's going to wrap up this newcomer's primer for Saga, so thank you all so much for watching. If this video series was helpful to you in any way, please let me know in the comments below what you want to see from this channel moving forward. I definitely plan to make more Saga content in the future, including long form deep dives, lore analyses, guides, etc. I also plan to do something before and during Emerald Beyond's release as well. I'd like to once again thank the community members of the Saga Wiki Discord and subreddit for all their help and contributions to this project. If I've forgotten anyone's name in the credits, please let me know and I'll fix them accordingly. And whether it be here on YouTube, on Cerulean Skies, or every Tuesday and Thursday on Super RPG Friends, I hope to see you all very soon.